hello and welcome to the Kansas City Quality and Value Innovation Consortium's monthly forum. My name is Christina Pacheco and I am the newest member of the Kansas City QVIC team. Our vision is to bring multiple stakeholders together to improve the quality and value of healthcare. KC QVIC is supported by our partners BioNexus KC, UMKC NextGen, and KU Frontiers Clinical and Translational Science Institute. As many of you know, the Kansas City Triple Aim is to find ways to deliver better care at lower cost to achieve better health for patients and populations here in Kansas City and our region. The Kansas City QVIC has centered around three key activities. Our first area focuses on our regional quality improvement projects. To select these projects, we collected input from stakeholders to better understand the priorities in the region and to identify topics that would allow us to implement initiatives and evaluate the outcomes of evidence-based strategies across multiple hospitals in Kansas City. Ultimately, we settled on two different projects. The first is Casey Epic, which is our opioid project, and we have eight hospitals participating in that project. Second, is our Transitions of Care for Heart Failure project. We have 11 hospitals that have expressed interest in that project. We also developed the Tiara program, or Training and Implementation Actionable Research Approaches. This program educates investigators, quality improvement personnel, and others about implementation and methods behind implementation. And finally, what you're here for today, the KV KCQVIC Forum, which is a strategy for engaging our communities and stakeholders through the dissemination of information that is important to you. We have finalized our agenda for 2021. And this month, we are focusing on ethics in healthcare, COVID-19, vaccine allocation, and current priorities. Next month, we will be discussing reducing readmissions for value-based care. So please mark your calendars for March 18th. Until further notice, all of our forums will remain virtual until it is safe to hold them in person again. Today's forum was a popular topic from our survey that was conducted last year and a very timely one. On January 25th, the CDC released data showing that Missouri ranked last out of the 50 states when it came to the vaccine rollout with only 4.4% of eligible of the eligible population having received their first dose of the vaccine. It's important to note that not all of our speakers will speak directly to the COVID-19 vaccine allocation, but their presentations will encompass other priorities with regards to ethics and healthcare. Our first speaker is Kelly hans reed Director of Medicaid and Children's Mental Health with the Department for Children and Families. She will be speaking about preventing child maltreatment in healthcare. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Go ahead and start my presentation here um, in regards to um, a little bit about vaccine distribution in, um, for our population, but more so um, just about child maltreatment and its effects on lifetime health. Um, so first of Ellie, all- Before I, you get started, we are yeah. seeing your presentation in my presenter apologies. mode. So it's not full screen. Better. That's better. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry nice. <about> that. <laughs> um, so first of all, I just want to take a second. And if you can imagine um, that um, your, your family, if you think about, you know, a lot of times we work with families who are struggling and um, children who have endured maltreatment. So just for a second, I want you to imagine if you are a single parent um, possibly you have work long hours to make ends meet. You live in um, substandard housing, but it's what you can afford. Your children are in um, school, but they're not actually attending in person. And you have to somehow manage to go to work every day. Uh, many American families find themselves in this position um, every day. And unfortunately, sometimes scenarios like this will end up uh, rising to concern of, of uh, professionals and they'll get involved in the child welfare system due to a hotline. 
Um, and so, you know, really um, generational poverty, uh, living in uh, um, unsafe neighborhoods, and enduring systemic racism sometimes puts these families at a higher risk for involvement in child welfare. And so um, talking about uh, the vaccine rollout and when we talk about uh, populations of people that will have a harder time accessing the vaccine um, or potentially who are at a higher exposure rate to the virus, I think a lot of times we are talking about this same population. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, families in child welfare often find themselves um, in unique situations in which it's hard for them to get appropriate health care and um, and it's just difficult for them to have access um, as far as transportation and time off work to get the kind of services that they need. So um, when we think about um, ensuring that everyone is getting the vaccine, thinking about these families and thinking about their work schedules, how they get places, things that we take for granted. I could easily take an hour off work tomorrow. My kids are cared for, my boss would let me leave. I have a vehicle with gas in it to get somewhere to get the vaccine. Many of our families, first of all, don't have time off work or they don't have reliable transportation or even if they do and they have to ride the bus, this week, if you have a lot of young children at home, it would be a huge, um, um, a huge thing to overcome to, to actually take your children outside in the freezing temperatures to find, you know, walk blocks to the bus stop, get on the bus, and actually get yourself to uh, a clinic or whatever, uh, what have you, to get the vaccine. So just thinking about um, those types of barriers that our families face. Uh, I think is really important in this. In addition, families that find themselves involved with child welfare have often endured um, traumatic childhoods themselves. So some of these parents would also um, potentially be at a higher risk for comorbidity disorders um, and other health risks such as obesity, diabetes, asthma, due to their traumatic childhood and the inflammation that they potentially felt in their bodies growing up in maybe an unsafe situation. So thinking about parents also being um, maybe had a higher risk for some of the health complications that we should be concerned about considering um, with COVID-19 in addition to um, um, the transportation issues and um, also probably them having jobs that put themselves in a high contact with lots of individuals, you know, such as um, the hospitality industry, uh, gig working, shift working, things like that, that may um, put them at a higher risk to develop um, um, the illness. Uh, in addition, um, just the racial disparity, again, which we know in healthcare, but also there in child welfare, it's the same. Unfortunately, there's an overrepresentation of African American and Native American children in our system. Um, in some areas of the nation, about um, 12% uh, of African Americans reside within the population, but unfortunately in child welfare, it's about 33% of, of African American children are found in the child welfare system. So unfortunately, very disproportionate. It is something that we're trying to keep an eye on, but something to be, um, to be considerate of. In addition to other children or young people that were serving in the foster care system, many of them end up in group living settings, congregate care facilities, and those facilities have definitely had a big challenge when it comes to the spread of COVID-19 and those um, you know, large facilities with lots of youth um, mingling in addition to the staff that, have, that are charged to take care of them. Another issue that we're facing is young people who've aged out of foster care. So this population we tend to think of uh, 16 to 21, or 16 to 18 to 26 year olds really, and um, these people have aged out of foster care. They, they, that means they really never had a home to go to. They, no one adopted them. They weren't able to go back home with their parents. And so these young people are trying to make it as adults in this world without a whole lot of guidance. So if I was a 21 year old who was battling potentially asthma or diabetes and I knew I should probably get this vaccine because I'm at a higher risk or the, maybe the one of the jobs that I hold serving the public in person. Um, 
typically what I would do as a 21 year old, I would call my mom and I'd ask her, where should I go to get the vaccine? Well, unfortunately, these young people really don't have that support that other typical young people do. Um, so just to, something to consider um, with the vaccine distribution, but really um, talking a little bit more uh, uh, upstream more broadly about health disparities for children who experience foster care. Um, so Bessel van der Kolk, it, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk was a, a professor of psychiatry at Boston University and he spent a career studying um, adults and children with traumatic experience. Oh, Kelly, we Kelly, got a mute button. Muted. Uh, he also founded um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, and he says the parent-child connection is the most powerful mental health intervention known to man. So knowing that, you know, in this time of pandemic where we're isolated, you know, really talking about loneliness and connection is going to be extremely important for people's mental health and physical health. Um, but unfortunately, um, if we think about what he says is true and we think about how we address child maltreatment in America today is how do we address it? We separate these children from their parents who potentially have abused or neglected them. So if we've built this child protection system um, to end these very important parent-child relationships, why do we think that's actually gonna result in, in good health outcomes in later years of these children who experiencing that or who experience that? Um, and also how, thinking about why do most people who get these uh, relationship severing um, services are largely groups um, affected by poverty and also are very often members of minority groups. And how did social workers who work in child welfare become the police of these relationships instead of what we really want to become and we should become is healers of the relationship. And how do we support parents to appropriately care for their children. Um, so what some just outcomes of foster care that I think is important to know if for people, for kids who um, have experienced child maltreatment, there have been several studies done. Um, and the ones that I like to talk about or are those ones in which the children were on the margin of foster care. So they took a subset group of children in which they could have been removed from the home or they could have stayed home. It was kind of a um, the, it wasn't a high risk situation. Please hear me say that child separation from their um, from parents when abuse or neglect occurs in serious situations is sometimes a life saving task that absolutely needs to happen. But unfortunately, um, it doesn't really result in really great outcomes for those children. So how do we support parents to better parent their children without abusing or neglecting them? So one of the studies that looked at those children on the margin they found that um, even short-term placements into foster care where they're kind of in an unsafe situation. So they said, well, what the heck, let's just pull them anyway. Those actually, even if it was a short couple weeks stay in foster care resulted in complex trauma and severe emotional distress for these children. And we all know that severe emotional distress during a developmental period is really going to impact a child's um, you know, brain development and physical health. Um, also what they found was um, children who have been removed from the home also have a higher likelihood of learning disabilities, developmental delays, and just lifelong negative health. And that was a study from um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so as you see here, um, there are several many negative health outcomes for children who are experiencing foster care. Those, those statistics are astounding in my opinion, especially when you consider you know, most of them are behavioral health related. In this, in this study, also uh, an American Academy of Pediatrics study, they actually took out a subset of children that were currently residing in an acute psychiatric facility or a psychiatric residential treatment facility. So those are the highest acuity kids who are really struggling with their mental health. Those children were completely taken out of the study. And the, the children who experienced these outcomes of six times likely to have behavioral problems or seven times likely to have depression, those were kids that were not in the high acuity um, category. So, um, you know, how do we combat these, these statistics? And um, in, in addition, like, why is this happening? Like, why do kids in foster care 
or who have experienced foster care have vision problems. That, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And, and largely what they found is that when children endure trauma, either by living in an unsafe neighborhood, witnessing violence, even experiencing systemic racism, um, their bodies uh, process that trauma uh, and their, their senses are heightened, which can sometimes cause inflammation in their systems which then wears the system down and it causes um, you know, metabolic disease, heart disease, and a, a variety of other disorders as well. Um, and the thing about the trauma is how severe is each child gonna be impacted? Because to some degree, most of the population is gonna have trauma. That is not a death sentence. But what is important to consider is the severity of the trauma, the timing at which in the child's life it was experienced and, um, and um, just the duration, the surveyor, severity of it. And so uh, that again is not uh, a completely negative sentence if the child is connected to someone who is completely supportive of them. The presence of one even extremely supportive relationship, just one supportive relationship can really buffer the negative effects of trauma. So, you know, keeping that in mind on how impactful uh, supportive relationships can be for this population. How are we going to help enhance uh, supportive relationships to these children and the parents that care for them? And if you would like to do some further digging on that, Jack, uh, Dr. Jack Shonkoff from the Harvard Center of the Developing Child has a lot of ex fabulous resources on, you know, inflammation, trauma, the effects on the on the body and childhood development, um, and you know, we just know that this trauma can affect potentially every mechanism in the body. Um, and, you know, as professionals on this call today, policy makers, leaders of human service agency, uh, people who develop interventions or practitioners even, how can we reduce disparities um, and, and reduce these preventative, di preventative diseases in premature deaths and lower healthcare costs. Um, and it's really trying to address the trauma and early childhood adversity by giving caregivers and parents the support they need to be fully present with children and also the financial resources they need to truly be successful. Um, just another really interesting study is a joint study done by uh, um, University College London and King's College in England, and they analyze data for 350,000 people. So a very large sample size when it comes to child welfare types of studies. And they did a they asked individuals who had experienced foster care or again, um, on the cusp of foster care. So maybe had several abuse and neglect investigations from professionals, but ultimately were kept with their parents. Um, and they asked them at 10 years, after experiencing foster care and 30 years after experiencing foster care to do a self-report on how they felt in their health outcomes. And as you can see here, 30 years after experiencing foster care, those who actually got to stay with their parents only had a 20% of uh, reporting of negative health outcomes. However, children who were removed into foster care and actually placed in a residential setting, they actually experienced over 80% negative health outcomes. Um, so really astounding types of uh, facts there that I think are worth considering. So if we can predict this is what is going to happen to children who are removed from their homes, how do we prevent that? So if we know that child maltreatment is so damaging, you know, how can we prevent these diseases and deaths? And it's really the ultimate form of prevention and moving upstream and that is really, you know, getting ahead of the child, child maltreatment by really helping support families, um, it, be a connector to services and supports instead of a separator, and really try to heal the whole family system and not just the child, because healing happens in the context of supportive relationships. So I'll just kind of end here right now. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perry, um, famous psychiatrist, uh, as a professor at Northwestern, has written um, several best-selling books, actually just released a book with Oprah this year, uh, maybe even this month. Um, and he is also the founder of the Neurosequential Network. He uh, also the founder of the Child Trauma Academy. 
says the more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive as the relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. So we can continue to try to treat diseases, of course, with medication and, and other intervention, but how do we show families that have come upon hard times who truly love their children and are doing the absolute best they can, how do we show them love, caring, and connect them to supportive relationships that are gonna help them appropriately care for their children? So not um, super heavy on the uh, uh, vaccine distribution, um, but hopefully just some food for thought when treating or considering treatment for these, this population and, and how to really look at uh, uh, the health outcomes over the, over the course of the lifetime and how do we intervene as early as possible to prevent those from happening. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that if they have questions for Kelly or any of our panelists, please feel free to ask them in the chat box. Um, our speakers will try to address them there. And then as we have time at the end, um, Dr. Stacy Farr will facilitate a question and answer session. Next, we have Dr. Chris Krenner, and he is the Robert Hudson and Ralph uh, Major Professor of the History and Philosophy of Medicine and the chair of the Department of History and Philosophy of Medicine at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He will be providing the historical perspective, um, polio vaccine history, and looking upstream. Welcome, Dr. Kerner. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to QVIC for this invitation to join you. I'm excited for the opportunity to this wonderful panel contribute. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of polio vaccine really focusing on the 1950s and maybe be able to offer some observations that are useful in the further consideration of the ethics of vaccines today. Uh, uh, polio, um, let's see if I can, looks, this is a schematic of the polio virus. As you can see, it looks a little more cuddly than our image of the COVID virus today. But this was the epidemic disease in many ways of the 1950s, um, and certainly the source of major panics in American society um, as polio would sweep through different uh, um, communities uh, in waves. So in a severe epidemic in, uh, in the 50s, you might see as many as 100,000 cases nationally, killing thousands uh, and leaving a legacy of paralysis among uh, many more previously healthy children and teens. In hindsight, it kind of looks as though polio was a, a public health hazard that drew more than, it drew a kind of outsized attention. Uh, there were probably more than three times as many deaths in any year in the 1950s from tuberculosis, for example. But the image of children um, disabled by polio and the image of iron lungs created an enormous, powerful national concern. Um, and I guess we can't always choose our public crises. Um, in the 1940s and 1950s, um, there was a major national initiative against polio um, led by uh, the organization um, then known as the National Infantile Paralysis Foundation. Um, there were very few, there was nothing um, significant uh, within uh, um, a government um, or organized medicine in comparison. This was um, the attack on polio. Uh, it, uh, the NI, NIFP also came with a very effective fundraising arm the March of Dimes, um, which uh, if you're, I still remember the days when it was still visible raising funds for what became the successor to the problem of, uh, of paralysis in children, cerebral palsy. Um, and now still can actually still exists as a philanthropic organization uh, supporting um, general health issues for, uh, for maternal and child health. But at the time it was focused on polio. Um, by 1950, the NIFP had made polio vaccine a major priority to find a vaccine to prevent this dread disease. There were a bunch of different uh, candidates for vaccines at the time, several, in fact. Um, in the age before genetic engineering, though, you can pretty much break them down into two groups. There were um, killed virus vaccines, um, which uh, disabled the virus so it was non-infective, but then still triggered immune response. And there were Live, vaccine, live virus vaccines, still many live virus vaccines, as you may know, in use today. Um, these were vaccines created by passing the virus 
generation after generation through a host vector um, in order to develop an attenuated version that was not uh, virulent, didn't cause disease, but still triggered an immune response. In, in modern terms, what we would think of today, what they were doing is um, uh, in the laboratory, stimulating uh, the production of mutant viruses until they could select out a strain that lacked the ability to cause disease, but still um, generated immune responses. Um, as I said, there are a number of groups working on this under the aegis of NIFP in the 1950s. Um, and I have a great picture here of, uh, this was taken later, sort of a celebratory photo of many of the people who contributed to this effort. Um, uh, it, our, our story will focus a lot on the character here, just to the third from the right. Um, this is uh, this is Jonas Salk, who many of you may know as the creator of the Salk vaccine. You can see a maybe a familiar looking figure standing next to her, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, her husband, FDR, um, suffered from polio, as you may know, and was the person who helped to create um, the uh, the NIFP. Um, under the aegis of this character, all the way at the end here, Basil O'Connor, who single-handedly ran, administered the NIFP, and spearheaded all its efforts in vaccine production. It's worth noting the figure in the middle here, um, or largely because she gets left out of the story. This is Isabel Morgan, too often overlooked. She actually developed the first successful killed virus vaccine. Um, this was the progenitor to uh, Salk's vaccine. Um, she was the daughter of Thomas Hunt Morgan, who is arguably the person who created um, experimental genetics. Uh, um, and she, and um, her vaccine work on polio was at the sort of peak of her career. But just after she created the, the vaccine, she was married and uh, she chose to marry. And then she had to leave her role at Hopkins and left this work behind. Uh, it's kind of an earlier version of the barriers that you still see that women face in scientific enterprises. I just wanted to make sure to point her out. Um, and the other character that will um, spend some time talking about this in this talk is um, this fellow, Albert Sabin, who was working on a competing version of a live virus vaccine. NIFP was funding this whole enterprise to the tune of you know millions of dollars in the 1950s. Um, for reasons that were at once um, personal, political, um, contingent, scientific. It was Jonas Salk who, uh, whose vaccine gained priority at NAFP. Um, and that was really, as I said, the only game in town. With the massive backing that NAFP could provide, um, Salk developed a pre and preliminary tested a, a, a pretty successful looking um, vaccine, showed great promise. And with encouragement by NFP, he, uh, NFPF, he mounted, went on to mount an incredible a nationwide experimental trial of the vaccine that enrolled over 600,000 children in a placebo-controlled um, randomized trial to demonstrate the effectiveness of the vaccine. It was a massive undertaking, one probably one of the greatest 20th century public health enterprises that happened. Though ironically, of course, it happened with virtually no involvement from what were pretty uh, deeply underfunded public health structures at the time, purely out of the philanthropic organization of NIFP. The NIH also played a small role, as did uh, a number of different academic medical centers across the country. Um, but it was largely an, eff uh, an effort that worked in, it was took place in the halls of NIFP. Uh, Salk's vaccine trial was, as you uh, would maybe have predicted, um, an enormous success. Um, and and uh, the announcement of the success was uh, an event that was stage managed by NIFP. Um, that uh, as a sort of rollout of this uh, remarkable news, it uh, led to kind of cheering in the streets across uh, America. But looking back, we may wonder um, at the many influences uh, that played into this choice of NIFP to prioritize and back so um, uh, sort of unilaterally the Salk vaccine. The historians have noted the outsized personality of Basil O'Connor. Uh, you saw him in that photograph. He presided over the NIFP and, and uh, it was a role that he had created for himself. He actually began as um, the personal lawyer to FDR because of FDR's interest in polio. Basil became the head of this national group to fund research and, and treatment for polio. We could talk about the character of Salk himself shown in a characteristically kind of heroic pose here. Um, 
he was a passionate uh, lab rat who drove himself really unrelentingly to attack this problem. Um, the deliberations on this vaccine involved many strong egos, took place entirely in little groups um, of experts and administrators gathered together by O'Connor inside the um, the bill inside the hallways of the NIFP. And, and there's also a degree of random chance involved too, just in the, in the development and the fate of the salt vaccine. After the uh, success of the field trial in 1954, um, Salk was probably one of the most celebrated individuals in the nation, uh, perhaps the world. But his vaccine shortly after that dropped from use and was replaced by a live virus vaccine developed by Sabin. It's worth noting the intense pressure that NIFP, NIPF put on Salk to get to this prize of a massive demonstration of vaccine efficacy. Um, but in the process, they may have neglected an equally great challenge that they faced um, after it was uh, tested and proven to manufacture and distribute the vaccine at the sufficient scale. In 1955, the Salk vaccine, after its, after its rollout, met with a pretty quick and, and fairly tragic turn. There was a catastrophe um, that the national media that was still somewhat enthralled to Salk's celebrity called, quote, the Cutter incident, um, named after uh, Cutter Laboratories, the producer of one of the one of the major producers, there were many of them in the nation of, uh, the, of the polio vaccine for general um, use. Uh, this is a vial here of their notorious vaccine. Um, Salk's complex process for um, producing the vaccine, for producing a killed virus vaccine, was known to have weaknesses. And the field trial had kept, these, um, on, kept the vaccine production under really close scrutiny. They farmed out production to a number of different commercial enterprises, um, but they kept um, the testing centralized at NIH and also testing by Salk and by the individual companies too. So there were several levels of check on the quality of, of what they were sending it out for the for they, what they called the field trial. They never called it an experiment because O'Connor saw that as maybe being a turnoff to people and rolling their children. So it's always called the field trial. Um, but once they had production, uh, they had really made a plan for uh, how to get this done. And they just sort of dumped bundles of money into the laps of different uh, manufacturing companies and uh, turned them loose to produce vaccine with little oversight. Um, the NIH um, stopped its regulatory role after it stopped being an experiment. Cutter Laboratories, it was later found, failed in one very large batch of, vac batch of vaccine um, to uh, completely neutralize all the, uh, all the virus. So it wasn't a, a killed virus vaccine as it was supposed to be. Um, in April 1955, this batch went out to uh, a, a, a big fraction of 400,000 children. Um, and this error uh, with the live vaccine ultimately caused about 40,000 active cases of polio in the group, um, left around 200 children with different uh, degrees of paralysis and killed either directly or through an intermediate transmission, 11 people. That left the field open uh, for this man, Albert Sabin, shown administering a dose of his own oral polio vaccine um, in this scene here. The Salk vaccine's uh, Reputation was uh, tainted, but it, it remained propped up for a time because of the justifiable fame of its inventor, Salk. Um, but the waiting in the wings were a number of vaccines, and Sabin in particular had been working on an oral vaccine as long as, Sa as Salk had been working. Um, although he lacked the backing of a huge national trial to demonstrate it, he had um, developed a pretty safe and effective form of this vaccine. Um, by 1961, um, and, and so there's a gradual shift after the Cutter incident and a variety of changes uh, that the Salk vaccine starts to fade and Sabin moves in pretty pretty steadily into to replace it. Um, I was um, I was born in 1961, and so as part of my vaccination series, I got a shot of the Salk vaccine. Um, but my younger brother, who was born in 1963, um, got the Sabin oral polio vaccine, um, which had been licensed in that year and and went became quickly became the the sole recommended um, form, and uh, but as as the, of over time, of course, the this was both vaccines were very effective, and uh, the level of polio fell rapidly, um, certainly in the U.S. Um, and uh, the Salk vaccine in 2000 came again into exclusive use in the United States because the um, performance of the characteristic of the vaccines um, changes in uh, relative to the 
level of the disease. So in high resource nations like the US, um, the level of, of um, complications, incident, um, uh, adverse incidents from oral vaccine dropped um, uh, uh, was, uh, was above the level of, the, of, of uh, incidence of the disease. That wasn't true in um, much of the lower income, mini intermediate income nations and um, the uh, oral vaccine continued to be used uh, and still is one of the ones for choice in um, low income nations. Now history offers some lessons here, um, but perhaps in this case, there are almost too many. Uh, you may see many sort of uh, uh, relationships with what we're talking about today. Um, I thought I'd leave that to you to pick out some of them. Um, and perhaps you should be listening too to the accounts of my colleagues who will follow, who talk a little bit more about the ethics of vaccines and their and their um, implementation and distribution. But I want to pause here to highlight a general observation about biomedical in inno innovations that um, I think opens an important space for improvement in the present moment. Um, to, uh, build, building on this observations about the uh, Salk Sabin contest. This is um, Ben Hurlbut, the historian today, historian of science, the same training I have down in Arizona. <laughs> he makes a great suggestion, that a great observation, that we typically defer for too long public deliberation on the social impact of critical new technologies. Um, he suggests that the ethics of innovation shouldn't wait till we have these different technologies in use, but we should look upstream. He wants broad discussion of public interests and engaging engagement of groups that traditionally are given little voice um, that starts early in the phases of technological discovery and development. The ultimate capacities of a new technology may not yet be set in stone while they're still being developed in the lab, but, but that's the point. Hurlbut asks, for example, he asks, um, why did it take so long? Why do we open public debate on CRISPR, this new bioengineering technology, only after that tool was already fully developed and in use? Then the ethics came to be discussed. After our hand was forced by growing awareness of disturbing uses of CRISPR that had been predictable right from the start. There are important societal implications that are surely visible as these technologies are being developed. And as key choices get made about how the science will be supported regulated and prioritized. Hurlbut calls for greater involvement of deliberative democratic processes at upstream where technological development happens, more than just access to knowledge, but um, an invitation to judge and to comment. Um, the polio vaccine story tells us that these large scale scientific enterprises will shift continually under the pressure of a great number of different incentives, accidents and biases, egos, the oral live virus Sabin vaccine was obviously easier to distribute and administer. That was evident right from the start when it was conceived. It proved to be very simple to make once devised and it turned out to, turned out to be very cheap to manufacture. Um, it's, there's obviously some ethical implications for the future use of this vaccine. And indeed Sabin vaccine quickly became remains almost uh, the leading vaccine in, uh, as I said, for global distribution, especially in low resource regions. As you will certainly hear from my colleagues, the distribution of vaccines have implications for social justice. The polio story leaves us with a strong impression that the NIFP barely thought about distribution before a lot had been invested in a particular vaccine. The riddle of a technical solution to a critical problem can absorb all the attention as it's want to do. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, we really, do we really have to wait downstream for the impact on social justice of our technologies? You can already see technical aspects of the current COVID vaccine, such as ultra low temperature storage that figure significantly in the debates over just distribution. Um, certainly important technical choices had to be made to get to these amazing, potentially life-saving vaccines and get them quickly into arms. That's probably the primary thing. But those choices also should be considered ethical choices. And I, thus I wanna close with the question, um, how do we make space upstream for social justice in the vaccine laboratory itself? Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kerner. Very important question. 
Um, again, I want to remind the audience that if you have questions, please place them in the chat and our presenters will address them there. And if we have time at the end, um, we will have a question and answer session. Next is Dr. John Lantos, the Director of Pediatric Bioethics and the Glassnap Foundation Endowed Chair in Bioethics. He's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine and a research professor of pediatrics at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He will be providing a healthcare perspective and how do we, de how do we determine who is at the highest risk? Welcome, Dr. Lantos. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we want to uh, immunize those who are, are at higher risk, and I'm going to try to talk about how we know or how we decide who those people are. Um, uh, disclosures, I'm a white male, I'm a pediatrician, and I have gotten two doses of the vaccine, although I'm not sure I should have been prioritized to get them. But my goals for today are to give first give just an overview of where we are with COVID in the US and the world today, talk a little bit about some of the frameworks that people have proposed uh, for allocation of vaccines and the conflict between two of them, saving the most lives or preservation of societal functioning, and talk about how we think about who's at highest risk for disease or death, who is an essential worker, and then how we uh, prioritize. So here's sort of where we are uh, as of yesterday. Uh, we're giving about two and a half million uh, doses a day. Uh, um, at the current rate, it'll take about eight months to cover 75% of the population, a number of people talk about as essential for herd immunity. We're doing better than most of the world. Um, uh, the darker colors are where the highest rate of immunization per country is. There are a few countries about the same or even higher than us, but most of the world uh, is way behind. And interestingly, the number of cases has been plummeting since about uh, uh, the middle of January. That may be related to the vaccine, although it's certainly not related to herd immunity at this point. Um, so it's a bit of a mystery. Um, maybe behavior, it may be cold weather. As with so much about COVID vaccine, we just don't know. We have a lot of epidemiology, but much less explanatory uh, science. So in deciding who should get the vaccine, uh, the CDC has suggested that there are three relatively se separable domains. Chris talked about this a little bit, but uh, there's the science of who uh, is at high, highest risk uh, and how well the vaccine works. There's the ethics of prioritizing people based on value judgments, not on science. And then there are some uh, important questions about implementation. Uh, even if we decide uh, who should get the vaccine, we still have to figure out ways of getting the vaccine to them. And there are the peculiar characteristics of these mRNA vaccines and the need for cold storage are an essential piece of the puzzle. Uh, this comes from the CDC as well. Uh, they said in thinking about who should be prioritized, there was a need to balance this idea of prevention and morbidity and mortality with preservation of societal functioning. I, I got vaccines, I'm a doctor, I'm over 65, but Everybody at our children's hospital got vaccines, people under 65, because they were deemed essential workers and preservation of societal function was uh, prioritized. You can see on this, uh, again, from the CDC, uh, if you choose one of these over the other, it may lead to different uh, prioritizations in what they called their tiers, 1A, 1D, 1C. Uh, uh, societal functioning would prioritize healthcare personnel, uh, prevention of morbidity and mortality would be long-term care facility residents uh, uh, or essential workers versus uh, those who are at high risk because of age or underlying medical conditions. So uh, my primary question for the talk today is if you were in charge, which of these would you pick? Uh, for both goals though, there are different choices in preventing morbidity and mortality. We have to know who is at highest risk for preservation of social functioning we have to know who is essential. So who, hit, who is at highest risk? Uh, this is a graph showing who actually gets COVID by age group. Uh, the elderly are not at the highest risk of getting COVID. In fact, 
people in their 20s are at highest risk of getting COVID, but they tend to have milder uh, disease. Uh, these are the mortality rates where clearly the elderly are uh, uh, at the highest risk, but that drops off uh, pretty quickly. And once you get down to people in their 50s or early 60s, uh, the more mortality rates pretty low. This graph just shows that the percentage of deaths in each age group is actually pretty comparable, uh, although the number of people in each age group is, is not. Um, but if you wanted to say, give the vaccine in a way that would lead to the most years of life saved, you might not prioritize people over 85. You could prevent their death from COVID, but they're gonna die relatively soon anyway, versus people 45 to 54 or 55 to 64. Everybody knows that uh, there are big racial disparities and uh, uh, health disparities. This is a complicated graph, but basically the uh, darker hexagons in this case, uh, in, in these uh, uh, pictograms of the different states in the United States show uh, how much racial disparity there is. The darker the line, the more um, likely it is that black people are dying at higher rates than white people in different states. You can see Kansas and Missouri both have uh, relatively high rates of disparities compared to uh, many other states just to uh, show this for individual states. In Missouri, um, the black share of the population is about 10%. Share of cases and deaths is closer to 40%. Kansas, the percent of the population is lower. Percent of deaths is about 30%. So this highlights the fact that if we wanted to target populations at high, highest risk, we would preferentially immunize uh, people in the African-American community. The numbers are similar for the uh, Latinx community uh, with similar disparities in both disease uh, and death. So who should get the vaccine? Uh, people have probably seen um, uh, uh, allocation frameworks like this one. This one comes from the CDC with phase one, phase one B, phase one C, phase two. Uh, this one tries to um, have it both ways with healthcare workers for societal functioning and residents of long-term care facilities prioritized equally. Uh, that in a way is the easiest uh, choice. Although even there, healthcare workers is a broad category that can be defined in lots of different ways. Does it have to be people with direct patient contact? Does it have to be people who keep the healthcare system functioning? Uh, are there tiers within tiers in the allocating vaccine? Uh, phase 1C, according to the CDC, which we won't get to until the spring, is uh, younger people or people with medical conditions or other essential workers. I'll get to essential workers in a minute. And then uh, finally, phase 2, which is sort of uh, everybody else. If you look at older adults, there's an interesting um, conundrum related to racial disparities. People might say that uh, we should prioritize people over the age of 75, but it turns out black people are much less likely to live to be over the age of 75. And so would be systematically discriminated against by a system that prioritizes people over the age of uh, 75 and to mitigate health inequities there at the bottom, uh, racial and ethnic minority groups less than <clears throat> 75 or less than 65 would have to be prioritized in vaccine allocation schemes in order to lead to equal prevention of morbidity and mortality. Uh, African Americans and Latinx populations also tend to have higher rates of comorbidities and long-term chronic diseases, particularly uh, obesity, diabetes, um, and uh, chronic lung disease. And so, uh, again, the decisions are not simply based on the science, but have to incorporate uh, these value decisions about the rationale for making choices that are informed by the science. 
And in the United States, we know that there is no one policy as there is in many other countries. In fact, decisions about vaccine allocation are not made at the federal level. They're made at the state level. And uh, this is a, a, a map of the United States showing which states have decided to focus and prioritize on Black and Hispanic residents for uh, vaccine rollout. The red is states not giving greater preferences to minority communities. Uh, uh, and um, you can make what you will of this map in terms of political alignments of the states, but it seems like there is a cluster of states not giving greater priority to uh, minority communities in the South and the Midwest. Um, that leads to uh, this sort of distribution of vaccine. This comes from New York, which is prioritizing, in theory, prioritizing African-American communities. But nevertheless, for all adults and for people over 65, there are huge disparities among races in people who have received at least one dose. This may not reflect the political decision. This may reflect the implementation science. It may also reflect distrust within minority communities and vaccine hesitancy, a problem that I'm not gonna get into in this talk, but that would have to be addressed in a very different way. Talk briefly about essential workers. If we think we ought to prioritize, prioritize essential workers, who exactly are they? Here are some lists. This one um, uh, looked at uh, frontline essential workers and then other essential workers. Uh, if you put these two groups together, you get up around uh, 90 million people. This would take up uh, most of the vaccine that's available throughout uh, the winter. Uh, one of the questions is whether um, uh, some of the groups within these essential worker groups ought to be prioritized over others. And one of the groups that's gotten the most attention has been school teachers, where uh, in general, school teachers themselves are not at highest risk, but in general, as the first talk uh, mentioned today, getting school teachers back into schools will get kids back into schools. Getting kids back into schools will be good for their mental health. And so it turns out uh, most states uh, have prioritized teachers, even among other essential workers. Uh, these are the states prioritizing teachers and school staff in phase one. We've been doing that in uh, Kansas and have done a number of mass immunization clinics uh, down in uh, high school gymnasiums. Uh, my conclusions um, that, uh, are that uh, the allocating, allocating vaccines requires consideration of the science, the ethics, and the logistics of uh, getting vaccines to the people who need it. The United States is doing better than most countries so far at getting uh, the vaccine out there. But deciding who should get it requires difficult value choices where we have to decide whether the goal is to save the most lives, to save the most years of life, to keep the economy functioning, or and or to reduce healthcare disparities. So far, it seems like um, there's vast differences between states in the United States as to which of these values is informing the vaccine rollout plans. But most states seem to be trying to get a little bit of everything as they go about uh, allocating the vaccine and thus allocating this life saving treatment. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, looking forward to the final talks in this and your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lantos. Next, we have Dr. Erica Blackshire, and she is the John B. Francis Chair in Bioethics at the Center for Practical Bioethics. She is a research professor in the Department of History and Philosophy of Medicine at the University of Kansas School of Medicine, and an affiliate associate professor in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington. She will be providing a research perspective um, focused on the democratic deliberation in pandemic planning and response the ethical and political significance of public participation. Welcome, Dr. Blackshear. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks for the invitation to be a part of this panel. 
Today, I'm going to talk um, about what de democratic deliberation is and why it matters, especially during a time of crisis as we're in now. I have three objectives. Uh, first, I'll introduce democratic deliberation as an approach to stakeholder engagement or public engagement. Second, I'll identify key values and features of deliberation and note an important critique. And third, I'll provide some examples of deliberations that I've been a part of, including a recent one that has been focused on the distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. The, the basic idea animating democratic deliberation is that people should have the opportunity to participate in meaningful ways in important social decisions, ways that supplement other democratic activities like voting, like interest-driven coalition building and politicking and peaceful protest. Now, the idea that people should have a voice in the, the rules that govern them is of course as old as democracy itself. And deliberative democracy as a school of thought is rooted in political theory and moral theory and makes the case in, in various forms for an informed and active citizenry that is engaged in its own governance. But what I wish to speak to you about today is not deliberative theory, but about deliberative praxis. Deliberative democratic theory has spawned a wellspring of civically oriented participatory activity around the globe. In addition to scholarly theoretical treatments of the ideas, organizations have sprung up to help citizens learn how to do it and provide space for them to do it. Handbooks have been written and deliberative experiments have prolifer proliferated. There are citizen juries, planning cells, national issues forum, deliber deliberative polling, participatory budgeting, and more. All are aimed at convening ordinary citizens to learn about, discuss, debate, and weigh in on impor important issues that sometimes affect them very directly or sometimes more generally affects them as citizens. Deliberation has also gained traction in the US health sector and is a part of a broader participatory turn in healthcare, biomedicine, and public health. The idea that people's views, their insights, their lived experiences, whether as patients, families, caregivers, participants in, participants in research, or participants in health insurance plans, or more generally, again, as taxpayers, as citizens, should be incorporated into the design and the implementation of health research, of health systems, of healthcare practices, of AI-driven diagnostic algorithms, and so on, is becoming commonplace. And in some forms, it's been root routinized. So take, for example, patient-centered outcomes research as institutionalized in PCORI, or examples like community advisory boards, community-based participatory research, which have been increasingly the expectation um, and is sometimes mandated as a, as a, uh, in order to receive uh, funding. Public deliberation, the approach I'm speaking to today, is also becoming common, so common, in fact, that the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, uh, funded a, a controlled trial some years back of deliberative methods to learn more about deliberation, as well as specific deliberative methods. I can talk more about that study in the Q&A if folks are interested. But let's dig a little deeper into what democratic deliberation is. So in the broadest terms, public deliberation is a serious substantive form of public discussion that seeks collective solutions to shared challenges. To flesh that, to flesh that out a little bit, here are some often cited definitions. So this, this quote, Democratic deliber deliberation aims at producing reasonable, well-informed opinions in which participants are willing to revise preferences in light of discussion, new information, and claims made by fellow participants. This first quote speaks to what's often called the transformative potential of democratic deliberation, which speaks to the fact that when you bring people together in a very intentional way for this sort of serious discussion, you get something more than top of mind opinions. The sorts of views we often get with surveys or town halls or even focus groups. Those are good forms of engagement, but they're not democratic deliberation. Or the second quote for which I am largely responsible and I'm realizing it's not the best quote, um, has too many words in it, but democratic deliberation engages ordinary citizens with diverse perspectives in reasoned and respectful discussion about important social issues in search of well-informed proposals that deliberants will view as legitimate. 
Now, this quote speaks to the a hoped for outcome that participants will view the process as fair, regardless of whether they agree in part or in whole with the deliberative output, with the recommendations, with the results. So as these definitions suggest, deliberative engagement is shot through with normativity and specifically with egalitarian and small d democratic aspirations. So um, what are they? Here are some of the core ethical and political values that underpin deliberative engagement, the process of designing it, and the hoped for outcomes of deliberative deliberative engagement. Here's what we hope to get. And when we do it right, we often do get these things. Better informed, more engaged citizens, mutual respect, even in the context of disagreement, the potential for transformation, civic connection and trust, more inclusive, informed, and just public reasoning and decision making, and ultimately more transparency, accountability, and legitimacy in decision making. So how do we achieve these high bar ends, these high bar goals? Well, that's a whole nother talk that I am sometimes asked to give, but let me just say quickly that deliberation design and implementation is an intensive complex process. And here are some basic elements in, in deliberation, some fe common features, core features, if you will. You need to recruit diverse participants and perspectives. You need to um, provide people with plain language, nonpartisan, balanced information. You need to create a conversation, structure it so that there are equal opportunities for people to participate and in a variety of ways to ensure that people with different learning styles and different communication styles can actually participate. And what you're looking for is not only people's positions and views, um, but also the rationales, the justifications, and the values that underpin those views. Deliberations are also civically oriented, which is to say they typically ask in various forms, what ought we to do about X? And in the end, what you want is output that is well-informed, carefully considered, that can serve as input into social, in social decision-making so that decision makers, people in position of authority can and it can look at those recommendations, look at those results, and incorporate them into important decisions. So there's an important critique from the left, something I know that I carry always with me when I'm involved in the design and implementation of deliberations. So despite the egalitarian aspirations of democratic deliberation, there are those who worry or argue that it will marginalize or silence the views and interests of minorities, those who are poor, those who are vulnerable that it will reproduce entrenched inequalities and that it overlooks other essential and possibly more important forms of action and agitation in the pursuit of a more perfect union. Um, that critique has stayed with me in my career as I transitioned from contributing to the normative literature on democratic deliberation in the space in the context of bioethics and health policy to actually beginning to experiment with deliberation, i.e. engaging in, the, in deliberation design and implementation. And I'm just briefly going to show you some examples of some deliberations I've been a part of. So I have been for the last four years and will for the next four years be um, con a consultant to an NIH Center of Excellence, the Center for the Ethics of Indigenous Genomics Research, which is based at the University of Oklahoma. And there my task is to work with, collaborate with Seeger leadership and tribal leadership to translate democratic deliberative principles into deliberative forums around issues of genomic research, biobanking, data governance. Um, I cut my teeth on deliberation design and implementation with this next um, study, the, an NIH funded study that was based at the University of Washington uh, called Community-Based Evaluation of April 1 Genetic Testing in African Americans. The task of that study was to gather diverse stakeholder perspectives on best practices in April testing. And a key uh, plank of that um, investigation was to um, implement, design and implement deliberations. And I led those deliberations. We conducted um, deliberations with African American uh, communities in three cities. But the one of most relevance is this last one. Uh, and that is a partnership between the Center for the Evaluation 
uh, for Evaluation and Applied Research at the New York Academy of Medicine and the New York City Department of Public Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, they have uh, planned, conducted, and are now just in the process of assessing the results of, an, of five online public deliberations together, informed guidance from a diverse cross-section of New Yorkers about who, among essential workers, should gain priority access to COVID-19 vaccination. In this case, I was not involved in the design and implementation of the deliberations. Rather, I was recruited by Dr. Martha Gold, who's leading that effort to be the ethics expert. Um, and so I was asked to provide deliverance uh, in, with plain language information about various ways to think about distributive fairness. So let me just stay on this for just a second and tell you a little bit more about this deliberation. And um, I'm not sure where I am in my timing, but I am almost um, near the end. Um, because this um, is, the press release is literally coming out tomorrow, I can say very little about the deliberation in terms of its substantive outcomes. But let me say this, um, and I have been given permission, permission by Dr. Gold and her, her colleagues to do this. The structure of the deliberation, so you can get a sense of this, we conducted three in English, two in Spanish. They were two and a half days long. We conducted them via Zoom, obviously, on, online. There were three expert um, presentations, one on vaccine safety and efficacy, one on COVID epidemiology, and then, as I've already noted, one by me on the ethics focused on distributive fairness. Um, there were 91 participants. Uh, they were very racially diverse. Over half of the people participating identified as people of color, and there were representatives from all five boroughs of New York City. There were two questions asked. First, in what order should the following essential worker occupations be given COVID-19 vaccine? And forgive me, I don't have them listed out, but there were about 10 listed, 10 occupational categories. And second, when prioritizing vaccine receipt, how should the health department take account of the following risk characteristics? And we considered age, neighborhood, race, ethnicity, under, and underlying health conditions. Now, what I can't have been given permission to share with you all is some information about the deliberative quality. Uh, deliberations tend to have pre and post surveys and uh, they're often focused on how people felt that the deliberation went and getting at sort of key deliberative uh, quality characteristics or um, indicators. And um, what we learned was that, and what I can tell you from my own experience of now being involved in a lot of deliberations is that overwhelmingly when they're designed well, and when they're facilitated well, and when the information people are given is in plain language and the right amount, people very much appreciate the opportunity to learn, not just from the experts, but also from one another. Because when deliberation goes well, people are talking to one another. Um, they appreciated having their voices heard and having that their, their voices be considered by decision makers in New York City at the Department of Health. And that appreciation was I have to say from the quotes that I've seen, which I'm sad I cannot share with you, particularly heartfelt by people who have lost their jobs, lost their apartments, lost family members. Um, and again, since I cannot describe the substantive recommendations due to the embargo, I can say um, that what I have read and I was allowed, uh, even though experts are, are typically told to leave the room uh, so that deliberants can do their work, I was allowed once in uh, back into one English deliberation just to listen to the plenary. And as I am always so impressed with the nuanced, sophisticated ways in which the deliberants talk about the issues. Um, so. Uh, let me just conclude by saying it's, it's my view that democratic deliberation can serve as an antidote, if you will, to the crisis that we're in. We're in a public health crisis, an economic crisis, a democratic crisis. We are rife with misinformation, disinformation, fear, uncertainty, and mistrust, and suffering and loss. And I do think that deliberation can serve it could certainly be preventative if we moved it upstream and if we had routinized it with throughout our society focused on, among other issues, um, pandemic planning. Uh, however, we, we, we didn't do that. And um, like so much with this pandemic, uh, we, we could have done better uh, by engaging the public in more long-term routinized deliberation about many things, biotechnologies, um, resource allocation issues, and of course, 
uh, the pandemic. We shouldn't wait till we get hit with one to begin to do this. And the last thing I will say is we have reached out to find out if there are deliberations like this going on. To my knowledge, to our knowledge, we can't find any democratic deliberations around COVID specifically in the United States. Um, I was just contacted by someone in the UK. They have not done any. We have found one that was done in Australia. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. Democratic deliberation is important. The public can do this work and um, it can be an antidote, not just to misinformation and disinformation, but to injustice. And I'll conclude there. Thank you so much, Dr. Blackshear. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Broderick Crawford and he is the president of the MBC Community Development Corporation. He will be providing a patient advocate and community perspective today. His uh, talk will be focused on community perspectives of health today. Mr. Crawford, there you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, So again, thank you uh, for inviting me and allowing me to speak with you all today. Uh, I'm, I have the uneasy privilege of following physicians. So uh, uh, hopefully we will be able to share just a little information. I will, as I start my presentation, uh, I want to uh, give a couple of uh, things for you to think about. So uh, when you think of community, uh, is that community the community or the folks where you live? Is that the folks where you work? Is that the folks where you worship? Uh, is that a race or ethnicity group? Or is that a research group? So as we begin to think about community, and sometimes I think we, we loosely use the word community, uh, but not really having the context of what that community actually is. So a little bit about myself. I'm going to read all of this uh, uh, historical perspective of my organization. Let me just say this. As I often have conversations with folks that are academics and researchers, when you think about community and when you think about who's on your team, does someone who looks like me, is someone that looks like me a part of your team? Uh, I happen to have the privilege of currently serving as the advisory board chairman for the KU Cancer Center. I happen to be a part of Pivot through the Masonic Cancer Alliance. I happen to be the one of the first, if not the only community investigator. I'm a principal investigator for what's called RADx, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics in Underserved Populations. I happen to be a bioconsultant for the current AstraZeneca trial that's currently ongoing part of the Health Equity Task Force in Wyandotte County, which has done a lot of work as it relates to addressing uh, inequities and disparities as it relates with both pop-up testing uh, that has occurred and also vaccine distribution. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, but this certainly is not the last thing I'm engaged in, I'm a part of the Recruitment Innovation Center which is a national advisory board out of Vanderbilt University and Meharic uh, Medical College, looking at clinical trials and how minorities are recruited and participate in clinical trials. So if you have projects that doesn't have someone from community at a high level, not just as a community advisory board member, but at a part of your project team, that might be something you want to consider. Today, I'm going to talk about a little bit about some of the things that are concerns within what I define as my community, uh, particularly as it relates to equity and the current health system. I've got a definition of equity, which I'm not gonna necessarily read, but also talks about how folks are impacted in their day-to-day -day lives, how care is provided, and, and does insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, or non-insurance have a, does it have influence on how care is provided. And then is it a system or is it a private provider question? And so we're gonna look at some of those things and have some discussions. So when we look at uh, the historical perspective, I'm sure all of you are aware of the 
project there that occurred in Tuskegee with syphilis. Uh, and that, and you know, it's interesting that as I have been talking with uh, folks in multiple communities, as I look at folks that are, so I'm, I'm gonna throw uh, good, the good Dr. Krenner under the bus. So he and I were both born in the same year, but he seems to have a little more hair than I do. So I don't know what happened. I must be missing a gene somewhere. But uh, to also share with Dr. Lantos, I too have received both uh, doses of the vaccine. I'm not sure that I am in one of those higher phase categories, but yet I've been able to receive the vaccine. And, and so how, how are we looking at how the vaccine is being rolled out, I think is very key for our community. Uh, also wanna talk about medication availability, whether it's done by gender, race, or ethnicity. And one of the things that reminded me, or I'm reminded of, as many of you may know, J. Marion Sims, who is known as the father of gynecology. Uh, he, he pioneered tools and many surgical technologies that are currently in use today. However, most of his technologies were done on enslaved women and, not, and by not using anesthesia. So all of the things that he developed were de developed on a group of people that had no control. Uh, uh, it was mentioned earlier, chronic disease. We know that chronic disease is a heavy burden in the African-American and Latinx communities. Why is that? Why do, does those two populations continue to see the burden of disease that is affecting them and their families on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about COVID. So, uh, many of you probably know that uh, when the first case of COVID came to our area and the first death, where did it happen? It happened in Wyandotte County. But yet when testing was made available, and I have nothing against these two institutions I'm about to mention, but one was in Indian Creek and one was in the plaza. So why were testing made available in places of affluence versus where the actual first death happened? Now, since then, as I mentioned, I, uh, now we have created, along with health professionals, community leaders, and faith leaders, a health equity task force, where we now have provided pop-up testing for COVID in places people normally don't go. So we know right now that the vast majority of African-American and Latinx folks aren't going to uh, PCPs, they aren't going to hospital clinics, uh, so where are they going and why is that? And so what we wanted to try to do with COVID testing is to take it to where they felt comfortable. So we had testing in church parking lots. We had testing in library parking lots. We had testing in uh, um, the Argentine uh, community center. We had testing in the KCK community center, all in parking lots. And guess what happened? When we provided spaces for folks to get tested, where they are familiar and they're comfortable, people responded. We had a overwhelming response in each of our testing sites, although it is true that testing has now decreased. Uh, I think there are a number of reasons for that, but it has it provided a space for folks to get tested in ways that they weren't done in the past or previously. Some of the things that have been shared with me by folks that are younger than, than Dr. Krenner and I, is folks are asking about access to food and nutrition. Where I currently live in Kansas City, Kansas, is considered a food desert. And so when a physician's asked me, Robert, you need to eat better and you need to exercise. Well, if I don't have a place to, to select those food items that will allow me to eat better, or if I don't have a place to, or, or example of, how to utilize good nutrition. One of the examples uh, earlier uh, was given on foster care children. Where do those foster care children learn how to cook? If they're going from foster place to foster place, at one point when they age out of foster care, do they be able to have those skills necessary for them to be successful? One of the things that's often said is all my doctor wants to do is give me a prescription. Uh, he doesn't ask me whether or not I could exercise. He doesn't ask me whether or not I had ability to do and make some decisions on my care that will help me versus just writing a script. And so that's something that, that is prevalent in our community as to 
what is the purpose for that physician? Is it just to write a script or is it to help me to get to quality care? An example that I will also submit is medical chart. And I have someone that was told that they, in the chart, it read that this person was poorly controlled diabetic. And when I asked why, they said, well, because I was prescribed metformin and metformin gave me severe diarrhea. And so I didn't want to take it anymore. And so instead of trying to say, okay, did the, the, the person fail the treatment or did the treatment fail the person? And I would submit to you that the treatment fell the person and there was lack of communication between that physician and that patient because there may have been an opportunity to come up with another treatment plan that would help that particular person be successful. But yet charting said this person was poorly controlled. I believe that is a mis that is not accurate chart. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I'm talking, I'm going to talk a little bit about communication. And here's where we have uh, an opportunity to really make some headway. Is that communication bidirectional? And so no matter what the case is that we're discussing as it relates to health, and let me just say that we look at health, not just as physical health, but emotional health, uh, economic health, whether or not this person is employed, whether or not the, the home environment is, is in a, a good place and where that person is spiritually. So we're looking at the whole person rather just at, at one person's health. So how is that communication happening? You know, if it's like my mom and I'm gonna throw her under the bus, uh, when she goes to her doctor's office, whatever the doctor asks her, she's gonna respond positively because she doesn't want that doctor to know that she's not doing something she is not supposed to be doing. For example, uh, Ms. Crawford, have you taken your medicine today? And she'll say, yes. And I said, I'll look at her, mom, did you really take your medicine? Well, I intend to take it. Okay, all right, I understand you intend to take it, but where is your medicine? Well, uh, do I need to go home and get it? No, well, it's still in the pharmacy. I said, mom, why is it still in the pharmacy? Well, I haven't went to the pharmacy to pick it up. Well, why haven't you gone to the pharmacy to pick it up? Well, because I was paying for my grandson's X, Y, Z. And so there's a conversation that needs to happen that typically doesn't happen in a 15, 20 minute office visit. And so if you don't have all of that additional information to really understand and what was happening with my mom, she was getting five different hypertension medications because she wasn't telling each of her physicians, whether it was her gynecologist or, or my mom is diabetic, so she sees an endocrinologist, you know, and so she wasn't sharing that information so that communication was not bi-directional, it was simply one direction. And that then impacts the ability for sustainable quality care because my mom's care wasn't quality because she was not being able to communicate in a way that helped her move her uh, care in a positive direction. We have folks that uh, are unsure of the access of quality. Again, going back to the trust factor. Uh, it is, you know, I, I often talk to some of my colleagues in several of our uh, institutions and health systems here, and I give the example, I said, if I walk to the front desk and your son or you walk to the front desk, how are we going to be received? Will we be treated in the same way? And I've used the example of where I've gone to a particular location, I'm not going to call its name, but I was being treated ill, and I just happened to know the, the clinic director there. So I'm on my cell phone calling the clinic director, hey, why don't you walk down here and, and don't come in, but just listening, listen to what's happening. And she was astonished. And I said, see, that's what happens. If you're here and they know you're here, they're gonna act in a certain way. But if you're not here, who's QAing to make sure that the, the way that individuals are treated when they walk in the door is the way that we all want it to be done in a, in a fair, uh, balanced and equitable way. And then we also have uh, many of our uh, members of our community that want to be provided with alternative options. Again, I spoke about this when we talked about script. So what else can be done? I have a good friend of mine who is a cancer survivor who never had radiation, who never had chemotherapy. She changed her diet and she changed what she was doing and she is in, in a remission now. So there are examples 
of where now I tell people all the time that may not work for me, but this worked for her. So what are the options of care that we're making available to folks? And finally, I, I want to talk about a few uh, concerns. Uh, one, the, phys the physician to patient communication, I talked about that a little earlier, but even as it, rates, as it relates to race and ethnicity, each of our cultures look at things differently. Do you have the understanding of what's appropriate for that particular culture? Is it okay to talk to the wife versus the husband? Is it okay to talk to the son about the mom? Is it okay to talk to the uh, daughter about the father? And, and so how are we making sure that we are understanding what is a, a, appropriate and acceptable in each of our, in each of our cultures? Uh, where does the patient responsibility for care lie? I tell uh, individuals or when I have opportunity to talk with folks that you are responsible for your care, not that physician. Not that that physician isn't a very well-educated and has all great intentions, but you are responsible for your care because within that 15 minutes, your life, you spend most of your life outside of that particular physician office. So what are you doing outside the office matters a great deal more than what's happening inside that office because that's where decisions are made. You are responsible for your care and you need to take responsibility for your actions. Uh, does insurance matter? This is an age old question as we know in many of our states that are attempting to expand uh, Medicaid. Uh, does a Medicaid patient, a Medicare patient get treated the same way as someone with United Health? Does that person get treated the same way with someone with Aetna or any of our other uh, private providers? And does that matter? Should that matter? Is health a right or is it a privilege? I would submit to you it's a right and that everyone deserves the best care possible regardless of their insurance. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford. Um, Next, we have Dr. Stacy Farr. She is a research assistant professor with the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and she is uh, on our QVIC team. She is going to provide some wrap up thoughts. It appears that most of the questions got addressed in the chat box. Um, and given we just have a few minutes and want to be respectful of your time, I yield to Stacy. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking the same thing. So we had a lot of really great discussion in the chat box for everything from, you know, kind of addressing all of the speakers. So thank you to everyone in terms of, you know, medical passports for um, children, which, you know, hopefully we can get more momentum here going in Kansas. And there was discussion about, you know, Cutter and the history of the FDA. Um, there were some great questions um, also about, you know, kind of uh, democratic deliberation and other kind of uh, what other names can it go by and what are other, how does that differ from, for example, you know, qualitative research in communities and focus groups is also, and also community town halls. Um, but, you know, I, I really just, you know, and a lot of discussion about how we need to move, you know, a lot of these things upstream and, and how, um, you know, this is just, we've been learning a lot um, through everything we've gone through with this pandemic and, and the vaccine allocation. And I just want to, you know, kind of say thank you to all of our speakers. If anyone has any, you know, kind of burning question, uh, we probably have time for like one. Um, that if anyone in the audience wants to unmute themselves and ask, I would, I would open it up to you. Um, or if any of the speakers have any reactions to anything else that was said in the chat box, I'd definitely open it up to you as well. And hearing um, some quiet, you know, I just want to thank everyone again. We've had a tremendous panel. Thank you all so much for your time um, and speaking with us all. We really, really value these forums and the opportunity for us all to hear different perspectives and kind of come together and, um, you know, talk through and, and try to find ways to collaborate and grow and improve, um, you know, the health and outcomes for patients here in Kansas City. And so um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you.